Hello stranger, welcome back. This will be a complete step-by-step -step guide on how to light up your scene using EV Next, with its most important feature, global illumination. We'll also see how can we enhance the look of our scene using some additional elements. Before we proceed however, let's do a short demo of how EV Next works. Here an object is occluded by another object and part of it is lit by direct lighting from a spotlight. We can see that there is no bounce light lighting the dark side here. There is an option called ray tracing in EV Next and if we check that, magic happens. This is the simulated bounce light known as global illumination or GI. So this is the area directly lit by the spotlight and all the area down here is lit by bounce light or indirect lighting. We do have to bear in mind that this GI is screen space, which means it's only there as long as the direct lighting is on the screen. This is just inherent to how raster engines like EV work. There are workarounds to it, which we'll see later. This is the model that we're going to light up using EV Next. Alright, we have a completely dark environment here, which will give some ambient light by increasing the strength of the world shader. This gives us a uniformly diffuse light everywhere in the scene. Let's decide two things first, the motivation for our lighting and the time of the day. Since we're making this into a crypt of a Templar, we'll give it a medieval, eerie vibe. This opening over here will serve as a great starting point of a light shaft coming into the crypt. This will be our main light. The time of the day is about midday, as if we've discovered this crypt while working on an archaeological site. So we place a spotlight because they offer a greater control of where the light goes. We can adjust the size and power of the light by right clicking and dragging the mouse left or right. The size of the light is a bit smaller to cover the entire opening, so we right click again, adjust light size and drag it a little to the right. Now to give the light an angular entry, we move the light origin a bit to the positive Y axis. The yellow dot controls the direction of the light, so we grab it and place it on our point of interest. We also have a rendered view open on the right side of the UI. This gives us situational awareness of lighting at all times. Now we need to have a better control over the spotlight of where it throws the light in order for us to change its direction of entry, but looking at the same spot at all times. Don't worry, it'll make sense in a bit. For now, let's add an empty and move it on the same plane roughly at the upper border of the building. This will be the control point of our light. To bind the light to the control point, we select the light, go to constraints panel and we select a track to constraint. We'll set the target to the empty that we just created and lo and behold, we can control where the light falls by the position of the empty. This gives us two points of control. One is the target of light and the other is the origin of light. This will come in particularly handy when we're animating the light shaft. Let's adjust it for a dramatic angle for the entry of light. The light still feels a bit weak, so we'll increase the power by right clicking and increase power, then moving the cursor right or left to adjust the power. And since we decided to make the lighting conditions of the midday, so we can give the color a bit of a yellow tint. To have the outside feel like a bright midday, We'll make a plane and place it just over the top of the top entrance. Let's increase it in size to cover it all up and move it so that it covers it appropriately. This looks fine. Now we'll give it a material and this will be an emission material. It's not primarily there to light the scene but it will give some amount of light which will help us with the realism. There is one problem, it does not let the spotlight to pass through. For this we'll turn on back face culling for both the camera and the shadow. And if we now rotate the plane to set the normals right, it will let the light to pass through while emitting light on its own. Now arguably the spotlight is very strong, but the crypt is still not adequately lit by the bounce light. To mitigate this, we'll bring in an area light and increase the size of it to match the size of the opening. We can then go to the main camera view and adjust the power of light to adequately light the crypt from the inside. It's probably a bit too bright for the mysterious vibe that we're engineering, so we'll tone it down just a little. In order to match the light, we'll select the spotlight, go into its properties, hover over color and press ctrl C. Now select the area light, cursor over the color and press ctrl V. That copies the same color here as well. We can see that our lighting is now starting to make some sense. Owing to global illumination, we've got some nice shadows and ambient occlusion, especially in the crevices. Let's see how it looks with and without ray tracing. 
We can see that with ray tracing turned on, which is effectively the GI, the bounce light comes into function and the shadows are calculated accordingly. Now before we really tune the lighting, we'll place some tactical cameras within the crypt space so we can observe the behavior of light from different camera angles within the crypt. This will give us balanced lighting from all directions. The way I set up camera angles is that I explore different angles from within the scene and place the 3D cursor at the center of it. Then bring my own simple camera rig to it. It's similar to the spotlight rig that we made earlier, with the camera parented to an empty and pointing towards it at all times with a track to constraint. I select the empty from the outliner, press shift S and selection to 3D cursor. From here we rotate the empty such that the two blue lines are overlapping each other. Then selecting the camera by clicking on the outline and pressing ZZ or GZ to make the camera into place. It will be in place when the origin of the empty and the origin of the camera seem to fuse into one point. This way the camera animation becomes a lot easier. The camera rig is a part of my starter file as well, which you can download for free, linked in the description. Now to quickly switch between cameras 1, 2 and 3, we'll place markers by pressing M on the timeline. With these markers in place, we'll bind each camera to these markers by selecting the camera, selecting the marker and pressing Ctrl B on the timeline. This binds the camera to the marker. We'll bind the other cameras with the respective markers by using the same two steps. Similarly, play head over the third marker, select the marker, select the camera, Ctrl B, bind. We can change the viewing angle by selecting the empty and just rotating it along the Z axis and uh, placing it where we feel appropriate. With these cameras bound, we can press left and right arrow keys to switch between the camera views. This gives us good situational awareness of what's happening in the environment in terms of lighting. In EV Next, Bloom has been excused in the favor of real-time Compositor, where Glare Node now has a Bloom setting. We'll use Fog Glow setting with real-time Compositor turned on. We'll set the size to 6. Salty is the name of the game. In our final render, we'll take a camera angle from the central part of this photo scan as well. But if we see closely, there isn't much detail present there for light to interact with. Now we can't create geometrical detail here, but we can surely fake it. We can take the texture image input and run it through the bump node plugged into the normal. And this gives us some detail, although with some aliasing going on. We'll adjust the height of this first to make the light interaction subtle and not go too overboard with this. In the tombstone here we can see that how this introduces small scale light interactions and this gives it more detail. For micro interactions we'll add another layer of detail. We'll make this layer by a procedural noise texture. We'll increase the scale for the details to be really granular and palpable and we'll also increase detail and roughness for the same effect. We crunch the texture with a color ramp to increase the contrast and to really bring out that granularity. When we run this through a bump node, we effectively have two bump maps. Now, all that's left is to combine these two bump maps into one. We'll do this by using a vector math node and its operation set at add, so it adds in both the vectors. And if we plug the output of this to the normal input, we can see that the small details are being added with the micro details. And this gives us lots of details for the light to interact with. It means that we have some degree of freedom to take some close-up shots that would have otherwise turned out not so great. The stroke of magic here will be adding the volume. So we add a cube and scale it just to cover the area of the building. Notice that we've kept all our cameras inside the volume as well. And that gives us a gradual fade on starting from the camera viewpoint. We complete the ritual of putting down a principled volume and plugging it into the volume input of the material output. And we'll zoom in into the crypt space to modulate the density of our volume. Again, we won't go too overboard with this because we don't want to create dirty, murky environment. We want to create just enough density that creates god rays, but not enough that creates the environment murky. Like we've established before, Subtlety is the name of the game. The anisotropy value here dictates the behavior of light scatter inside the volume, with higher numbers giving sort of a misty effect. And since we're making our scene with a touch of mystery, we'll increase this just a tad. To give some character to the volume, we'll introduce some colors. We'll increase the saturation and go around different hues to see what settles best. A tiny amount of blue color makes the volume feel a bit more cinematic. We see how the scene is looking from different camera angles and it looks fairly balanced from all sides, so we'll call it a win. 
For animation, we start from darkness. A shaft of light starts to illuminate the crypt and continues moving to the left as if revealing the secrets of the tomb. The scene would fade away as the light shaft eases out of visibility. That's the idea. So by selecting the light and moving it around, we can explore parts of light that it illuminates and we'll select the path that looks the best. This is also a test of the GI functionality of EV Next. As the light moves, so does the bounce light illuminating different areas of the scene. We can test out another path by moving the light along the z-axis and see how it looks. From what I can see, I don't think there is enough bounce light to light up the inside of the crypt, but we do have a solution for that. We'll have to introduce more light somehow. In order to do this, we'll introduce a point light a little higher from the ground. This new source of light will simulate some more bounce light. We do want to be careful not to crank the strength too high for it to become a distinguishable, identifiable source of light in the scene. Remember, this is simulating bounce light. So right click and adjust the strength of the light to the point where it looks just about natural. And since the simulated bounce light is supposed to be from the same source as the main light, so we'll need to mask the colors. We control C and select the light, go to color and control V there. Now, because we have volumes in the scene, this small light also contributes in the volume scatter of the light. And we can see it here as a speck of volume scatter. And this is obviously not desirable for this light. We decrease the volume scatter all the way to zero to fix this. And now if we move it around, we can see that the speck of light scatter is gone. With the augmentation of the bounce light with this point light, we can now see that the scene is a lot more fuller with the good gradient fall off from the central source of the light into the distance inside the crypt. One thing to note, however, is that the radius of this point light needs to be a bit higher to make its light appear more diffuse since the bounce light is reflected in all directions. So as a comparison, this is how it looked before augmentation and this is how it looks after bounce light augmentation. This is still a static light. So we'll parent this light to the spotlight. So wherever the spotlight moves, this will follow wherever the light falls. This ensures that this augmentation setup can move wherever the original light source moves. So if we try and move the light now, we can see that we have a lot better GI effect. Before we finalize the setup, we see how it looks from all camera angles that we set up previously, and if the light path needs adjusting in relation to a particular camera angle. We can see that in this relatively close-up view, we can appreciate the fake details that we added to give more texture and light interactions. These small micro-interactions do make a difference in the final look. As a cherry on top, we'll introduce a geometry nodes-based particle system which simulates dust. It's a free system that's my go-to for atmospheric particle effects and I'll link it in the description as well. We can easily change parameters like speed, direction, movement, randomness, all according to our scenario and this just adds more life into the final shot and I really love adding these sort of uh, imperfections. We can now render it out. With some post-processing and color correction, this is the final sequence. Leave a comment if this was helpful and subscribe if you learned a thing or two. Until next time, farewell.